Good. Welcome. Welcome, all of you. I understand that there are more than 170 guests who have come to join us for today's important event. Um, this is our virtual forum on the theme, the United Nations at 75, past, present, progress, the future we want, collaborating together. This is one of three programs the, where we're celebrating as the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area, the 75th anniversary of the annual meeting that we normally have to celebrate the um, United Nations um, each year. Um, we've already had two meetings. One was a wonderful meeting last Saturday night of people who couldn't have dinner together, but what we call the career dinners series with all of our young professionals whom the audience should know now make up 30 to 35 percent out of our thousand members through the United Nations Association. Um, and we're one of the larger uh, membership associations. There are now 200 chapters with 20,000 members. So approximately 5% of all the members across the United States are part of our United Nations NCA chapter. Um, the other event we held, which was wonderful, I think many of you attended, was a conversation with Congressman Raskins, um, the Congressman from the 8th District, who has been so active as a constitutional lawyer, active in international affairs, a great supporter of the UN. And then a panel followed him of a discussion among four career ambassadors who come from our board and our advisory council. So it's been a month of active engagement, active opportunity to talk about the needs of the UN and to discuss together where we go from here. I want to say that today's program has been planned. You saw some of the slides of the screen um, planned and developed and organized by our UNA NCA president, Paula Boland with the assistance of Tom Bradley, UNA NCA Board Vice Chair of Programs, who will be joining us shortly, and with the outstanding help and support of two of our key full-time staff, Andrew Dahl, who's Managing Director of Programs and Membership, and Shana Vassar, Managing Director of Advocacy and Policy Strategy. I think you saw on a screen just a few moments ago a list of at least 18 sponsors, individual and organizational sponsors who have been very generous contributors for these programs that we've been operating. And indeed, they are representative of individuals who throughout the year, from our membership, from our board, from people who aren't members, from foundations and organizations, make up the necessary resources for us to be able to conduct our programs, including our global classrooms programs in local schools in Maryland, Virginia, and the district. Some now 1,500 students are served by us. Our advocacy programs, which aren't just related to Hill issues, but rather the opportunity to advocate for understanding and knowledge and support from the public in our area. We also have committee programs on sustainable development, international law, human rights, um, as well as the Young Careers program I mentioned, plus a graduate fellows program on UN subjects, which is drawn from graduate Graduate, um, graduate students from the universities in, in our area. Um, these are supported by a wonderful staff of volunteer interns, as well as um, four full-time staff and several others, including Paula, Andrew, and Shana, whom I've mentioned. This is a extraordinary year to be getting together under the circumstances of COVID, um, which seems to bring us together in new ways and more ways, which has been very beneficial for those who can't always come to a downtown office or a downtown location, but in fact, we found over the, come of the year as we transitioned starting back in March into a wholly virtual program for UNA NCA, that more people than ever have been attracted to these opportunities to get together, not just members, but visitors and guests, whom I hope will become new members or additional members as well. Um, we're very encouraged by that, given the challenges that we, we thought we would face in being able to get students together, uh, graduate students, key people from around the world to chat with us. Um, it's gone very successfully, and I want to thank again the sponsors for UNA NCA who make all of that possible throughout the year. In a minute, we're going to delve into discussions about where the UN is and where it's going, what opportunities and needs does it have to succeed in the future and to change with the times. All institutions who are 75, just like people, um, need to change and be reset for fitness, if you will, to take on the challenges in a new era. 
I think it's a little bit helpful just to take a moment to realize that the, the UN in this crisis um, is building on its ability to meet crises that start from the very beginning and the purposes and founding of the UN. Obviously, it was founded in 1945, 75 years ago, after the Second World War, in which there were more than 80 million people dying as a cause directly of warfare, citizens near the war sites. And interestingly, over 28 or 29 people or million people were estimated to die from the side effects of disease and famine, which accompanied the warfare. This sound, does this sound familiar? It sounds familiar to all of us as we're trying to understand the scope of a pandemic. And indeed, the history of the UN also reflects planning to address pandemics and to have a strong World Health Organization. Um, because only 20 years before the founding of the UN, the largest pandemic in the world actually had occurred in 1919 and 1920, 1920. So 100 years ago, the so-called Spanish flu, which was not at all Spanish, it, it derived from uh, an outbreak of a flu um, in, the, in the central part of the United States, but went around the world rapidly um, before there was any knowledge and test about how to address that. So we're dealing with a crisis today, which over the years, the UN has been well equipped and building toward and has addressed pandemics on a regular basis um, throughout the past three decades. I think of the HIV pandemic, the MERS pandemic, the SARS pandemic, um, and Ebola, um, not to mention we also have prepared with help from throughout the world, the critical nature of the UN's participation in eradicating polio and being successful in bringing under control those other pandemics and flus, which they don't necessarily ever go away, but the be human behavior and the management of them by UN agencies together with bilateral agencies has become a critical factor for our modern world. The history of the, the two wars that preceded the founding of the United States, of course, were aimed mainly at peace and security. But wisely, the founders of the UN, with leadership from the great powers, including very significant leadership from both President Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, basically set the pattern for recognizing that the immediate needs aren't necessarily those that must be addressed, but we have to, like we are doing today with the SDGs, recognizing the interdisciplinary connection among all issues from which people's health, education, training, opportunity, trade, and peace and peace building must be related so as to make a difference for the long term in people's lives. People must be served in ways that don't necessarily touch the immediate need if it's an outbreak of war or, or crime or injustice. These things have to be dealt with on a long-term basis, which is what was uncovered clearly in the treatment and the recognition of the spread of COVID. People with the most vulnerabilities in health, people without regular access to good diets, people without the opportunity to receive serious, long-term, regular and immediate care, um, and the ability to maintain a livelihood once they are recovered is absolutely essential across all of these disciplines. That's the role of the UN. That's the role of us as citizens of the United States, helping to make sure there's a strong UN today. And today, beginning the next 25 years after today, um, we expect that the UN will have a opportunity for our engagement over many, many, many years. We need to plan now though for action. Action today and in the next decade are going to be critical to the well being not only of the UN, but the well being of the world, the well being of all of us, recognizing that now within our reach is the need to touch on the climate of the planet and to save the planet, to make sure that that overarching challenge is going to be able to be overcome by our actions together. The, the United States has been a major supporter of the UN. And a lot of our advocacy has necessarily been to ensure that our citizens throughout the country, not just of our chapter, but by all the chapters across the country, bring to bear and knowledge how critical it is for the United States to play a leading role in the well-being of the UN 
and to ensure that it has the funding necessary to carry out its enormous agenda together with us and other countries. So today's meeting gives us the opportunity to discuss these issues, to set our goals, to understand each other's roles and how we can achieve these goals together and to go forward. We were very fortunate to have a secretary general for the past four years who's very adept at working with people across the planet, uh, working even today with the United States well when there's some issues in terms of full support from the administration through the UN and regularly has met with leaders of our country, leaders of the Congress, and is a traveler now virtually more so than otherwise. He is going to send us another special greeting right now in a short video. As the United Nations marks our 75th anniversary, I wanted to extend a special message to United Nations associations around the world. Thank you. Thank you for being among our best friends and indispensable partners. You are critical to sharing the UN story of advancing peace, justice, equality, health, and human rights for all. That work is more important than ever as we strive to overcome COVID-19 and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The pandemic is a wake-up call. We cannot go back to a pre-COVID world of inequalities and fragilities. And we must do more to respond to a world of challenges ahead, the climate crisis above all. Now is the time to strengthen international cooperation for the common good. Thank you once again for doing just that. Let's keep working together for the future we want and the United Nations we need. Thank you. It was such a clear, wonderful message and uh, thank Secretary General very much for sending that special message to all of our chapters and, and part of the associations around the world here in the United States. And, and I think uh, more than 100 countries have chapters of the um, United Nations Association as well. Let me turn now to the um, second part of our program, the first part of our program really. Um, and that's the opportunity to have Congresswoman Barbara Lee join us. Um, she's joining us virtually, but perhaps in from within the city. And I'm very pleased that she's here. I don't know whether she'll be on screen with me at the same time. But this is the time of the year where we make a, a special award of advocacy founded on the basis of the name of one of our great advocates, um, our former president, um, Eddie Edward Dick. Uh, Eddie Dick, as we know him. Eddie was a former president back uh, some 15 years ago, still serves as an active member of our board, and for many years chaired the advocacy committee of UNA USA. Um, and has been active in our advocacy committee. Um, he's a, uh, he has a, uh, I'm sorry he's not on screen because he has a, a kind of voice that uh, his very voice leads you to pay attention to him and his advocacy for the United Nations. So I thank, first of all, Eddie Dick, and I hope he's in our audience um, uh, here to give testimony to Representative Barbara Lee. Um, Representative Lee has had a life time history of support and advocacy for human rights and equal justice for all, including her leadership for justice for black men in her community, while a state legislature and community leader in California. Since 1998, for 20 years now, she has sought tirelessly and constantly for legislation that supports peace building and peacekeeping globally through the UN and by the agencies responsible for our security of the United States. Your leadership on the Appropriations Committee and the Foreign Ops Subcommittee has brought thoughtful and balanced knowledge and direct worldwide experience from her travels to the debates over UN funding, as well as our bilateral USAID programs. Her leadership on health and education for all and for human rights and justice is an extraordinary record of deeds in support of all of our well being. Um, this year, just for example, um, she has two bills directly relevant to the purposes of this meeting and our discussion. Uh, one of them on the House floor is House Resolution 1024, which recognizes the United Nations for its role in maintaining international peace and security, applauds the UN for its leadership in responding to global health and human crises 
and urges the president to call on Americans to observe the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the UN. And a very important additional international and domestic resolution is resolution 100, which affirms on the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first slave ship, the US debt of remembrance, not only to those who lived through the injustices of slavery, but also their de descendants. And two proposes a US commission on truth, racial he healing and transformation to properly acknowledge, memorialize and be a catalyst for progress, including toward permanently eliminating persistent racial injustices. The United Nations Association couldn't be more pleased than your willingness and interest, um, Barbara Lee, for accepting our advocacy award this year and look forward to hearing remarks from you. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. First of all, what an award to receive. This is very humbling. This is my life's work. So to receive an award for just doing what I'm supposed to be doing on this earth is just very humbling for me. It's good to see everybody too. I miss you. Hope everyone's doing well and healthy and of course, adhering to all of the health protocols. Hi, Peter, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see you. Uh, and just so uh, you know, this is such um, a wonderful moment, especially to be working with the United Nations Association and the foundation and all of our global partners in uh, our work for peace and justice and equality. And it's so important now to uh, engage our young people here in the United States in uh, the work of the UN associations. And so just know that that's part of my mission too, because I, I know that our young people care about peace and justice and the goals of the United Nations and the United Nations Association and Foundation. And so they need to be part of this. So Peter, you know, we got another, another job to do again. We've been talking about how we diversify the UN associations, how we focus on specific issues and how we rev it up with the Congress in terms of members who haven't uh, had the privilege to work with the UN. Well, now we got to work with our Black Lives Matter, our Dreamers, our Movement for Black Lives to get them engaged because this is so much a part of who we are as a country and um, who better to continue with this movement than uh, our young people. Uh, let me uh, just uh, to our uh, keynote speaker, Ms. As a, Modir, I just want to thank you for uh, being here and for your work towards uh, the vision of our sustainable development goals. And yes, this year, the 75th anniversary or next year of the signing of the UN uh, Charter, let me just say how proud I am to say that, um, of course, the United Nations was founded right across the bay in our magnificent uh, speakers district of San Francisco. Uh, who continues to fight each and every day on behalf of the ideals of the United Nations. And so I think I'm just probably about 20, 20 miles away from where the UN was founded. And, and I represent Oakland and Berkeley, California. And so the United Nations is, uh, and the recognition of its founding is very dear and personal to all of us in, in the Bay Area. As one of the uh, founding members of the United Nations, um, it's now, more critical than ever that the United States um, is fully engaged with the United Nations and that our strong partnership is maintained, even though, of course, you all know the challenges we've been dealing with. Uh, and I certainly do as a member and vice chair of the State Foreign Operations Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. But also as we face this unprecedented uh, challenge like uh, uh, challenges of COVID-19, uh, we've got to remember that uh, we're stronger. Our country is stronger and secure and more peaceful when we work together uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, and I've been privileged to be the Congressional United Nations representative on the Democratic side to the General Assembly for four times now. And this mission uh, is so important because I've centered it around encouraging mutual understanding and representing the diversity of the United States priorities and the United States Congress. Uh, it's been really an honor to have the platform to engage um, on a number of issues at the United Nations, working to strengthen our international cooperation to fight HIV and AIDS, uh, pushing to find peaceful solutions to conflict, joining with others around the world, uh, seeking to dismantle racist uh, structures and systems. 
everywhere in the world, including in the United States. And so we, through the Congressional Black Caucus Institute, established uh, a presence, an NGO at the United Nations to better connect with the UN and to connect with the UN associations and the UN foundation. Uh, as also the representative, I've been very um, keen on promoting and supporting the United Nations and making sure that members of Congress uh, visit the UN and understand the goals and ideals of the UN. And I just wanna thank everyone who has helped us facilitate many delegations, delegations of women, <laughs> of freshman individuals who recently were elected to Congress. And last year, uh, I led a Congressional Black Caucus delegation to the United Nations in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans to America to focus on the needs to end modern day slavery and to acknowledge and understand the legacy of slavery in the United States and around the world. And I'm so pleased that we finally, um, this was as part of my work uh, at the UN, uh, was a, we were able to get the United States to contribute to this beautiful, uh, powerful memorial, which um, <laughs> it was, Peter knows, it was quite a challenge, but we did it. And so now the U US is part of the overall uh, funding mechanism and help fund that beautiful memorial. Also, uh, I introduced the resolution supporting, and uh, I don't have the, the resolution number, but I know you all know about the resolution supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, reduce inequality, and fight climate change. The SDGs, um, they're really an urgent call by all countries, developed and developing, to work in partnership that reminds us that all of our global problems need solutions by all of us. And these SDG goals are so important in the United States of America. If you're a margin, come from a marginalized community, if you're from people of color, if you're communities of color, if you're a person of color, if you're a Native American, these SDGs, they resonate here at home. And so what I'm trying to do with this resolution is better connect members of Congress with the goals of, of the, SD, the SDG goals so that they can engage more in their districts on these issues that are really vital. They're not just international global issues. These are, I mean, abroad, these are global issues which include the United States of America. So instead of pulling out of international efforts like um, this administration has repeatedly done, the United States and its leaders must show the world that America puts our diversity front and center in, diver in our diplomacy and is willing to protect the lives of the most vulnerable groups in our society and throughout the world. As an example of the United Nations wonderful work that I am so, so happy to see is the UN World Program uh, for being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. How magnificent is that? Gosh, that is just remarkable, but way a long way overdue. The United States is uh, the single largest funder of the World Food Program, and it's a legacy that dates back to the earliest days of the organization. Our country's commitment for decades now allows the World Food Program to, uh, excuse me, to provide food assistance to millions of children, women, and men around the world. And I have seen them, visited them everywhere in the world. And believe you me, um, they've saved so many lives. And especially in the time of COVID when hunger is at historic highs, this support, we, we can't let up at all. We must move forward. And as we look back uh, over the last 75 years and look forward to the next 75 years, we must all uh, recognize the interconnectedness of today's world. We've got to continue to recognize our common humanity by working together with the rest of the world to address the economic and the humanitarian toll of this pandemic. And um, really uh, this uh, maybe a silver lining in all this is that uh, it's brought the globe and the planet and the people from around the world uh, closer together. And so I'm gonna continue to fight to support the World Health Organizations and all of our multilateral organizations to provide the coordination for vaccine development and distribution. And with climate change being the greatest threat to humanity, there should be no question that the United States must rejoin the Paris Agreement. That's only the start. 
The U.S. must demonstrate that we can transition away from fossil fuels and at the same time grow our economy and create millions of green new jobs at home and around the world. And uh, I know you know about my legislation that really says we must look at the impact of climate change on women and vulnerable populations throughout the world because we see already they're the hardest hit. And so everything that the United Nations uh, does for the next 75 years will need to be seen through the lens of climate change. So finally, let me just say, uh, in addition to the SDGs goals as the world's blueprint, and I really believe that of progressive goals, you know, I am really proud um, to say that the United Nations and all of you at the UN Association and the foundation have led so much in this effort. And I don't believe that uh, our congressional members would know what they know and support what is being done at the UN if it weren't for what you all are doing to educate members of Congress. When I came to Congress, mind you, in 78, uh, there had been a, a study or a survey conducted. And then um, it was over 60 members of Congress did not have a passport. And so uh, you all have helped <laughs> change that. Of course, now a larger percentage do have passports, but we still need to educate more the, the wonderful work uh, and the necessary work of the UN because the United Nations is the only agency that's about peacekeeping and preventing us from going into war. And I support the three tools of our foreign, three stools of our foreign policy, diplomacy, development and defense. But we've had, in the United States, too much uh, weight has been put on defense. We need to put more on development and diplomacy. And that's what the UN Association and the United Nations uh, has always prioritized. So thank you all again for this. It's such a humbling moment to receive this award. Uh, and I'm really uh, in Edison, it's what the Edison W. Dick, Dick, Dick Advocacy Award. And I tell you, uh, learning about his history and what this means to me uh, is is very um, rewarding, but it's, it's very humbling. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you for receiving the award. You mentioned Peter Yao a couple of times in your comments and I can't I see, see him. him. I'm glad you can see him. <laughs> and uh, I think the audience knows that Peter Yao is the president of the Better World Campaign and is our partner and comrade for addressing these kinds of issues and, and really our leader in advocacy. Um, let me call on Peter to say a word to you in public as well. Uh, Congresswoman, it's fantastic to see you. And as you know, I am the number one uh, member of the Barbara Lee Fan Club. Uh, I just want to thank you. I mean, what you have done on the State Foreign Ops Subcommittee to fight year in, year out on behalf of the United Nations, on behalf of UN peacekeeping, we couldn't do it without you, Congresswoman. And uh, you know, I'm not saying that there's a leadership change happening in that subcommittee beginning with Congress, but it's important that you become chairwoman of the State Foreign Ops Subcommittee beginning in January. Uh, that would be a dream come true for all of us UN advocates. It, you don't have to say anything, but I know what, what's going on. <laughs> and, but I also, you know, I want to say that we've heard you. You've asked us to. Uh, ensure that the United Nations Association is, is as diverse as America is. And we're so pleased as a result of your firm but gentle pushing, we now have uh, African-American staff leadership uh, at the United Nations Association and our volunteer leadership as well. And it's because of you uh, and what you've urged us to do uh, and we're deeply appreciative. And finally, when you introduced the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Bill, we had a job, we turned our UNA chapters around the country to get co-sponsors on that bill, to be part of a coalition that was getting people on that bill and really pleased to play that role. So again- Peter, we never, we're over 180 co-sponsors on that bill wow. now. And so thank you very much. That, and that's within four, four months. And John Lewis was one of the first original co-sponsors of the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Commission. So thank you so much. We never would have gotten to 180. We'll get to 200 pretty soon We're because of the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Okay. Thank you again, thank Congresswoman. You. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you, thank you for being our everybody. champion. Lovely to thank have you. you. Thank you thank so you. much. Peace. Now, thank you very much. <laughs> Peter, thank you. Good to see you too. Thank you for participating. I now have the pleasure of introducing 
Paula Boland, who is going to carry forward the program at this point. Um, Paula, as I think you all know, has spent a lifetime in her career here at the United Nations Association, starting as a young volunteer, starting as one of those young professionals seeking uh, opportunities to work in the international space. She's an international person herself, um, and she changed job titles, just to, in case you're confused. Um, I was a president not too long ago, and we decided it certainly made a lot of sense after 15 years of extraordinary leadership of this chapter of the association, the largest chapter of the association, that she was now operating at the highest possible executive level and the title of president made a lot more sense for her to have it than me as a volunteer. And so I'm now the chair of the board and I just love working with Paula Boland and having all of us work together under her leadership. Paula, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And it's a pleasure for me to work with you as well. Good evening, everyone, and happy UN Day. It is an honor to be with you today as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the UN. Thank you to our distinguished honoree, a real champion for us, Barbara Lee. Thank you to our speakers, sponsors, leaders, and staff for the incredible effort in putting together today's program. All we do at UNA represents a team effort, and today marks our fourth event this month. The UN Association and its members are united more than ever in their commitment to global engagement and their belief that each of us can play a part in advancing the UN's mission and achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. 75 years is a major milestone for us. This commemoration is about reflection, celebration of the progress made throughout multilateral cooperation and a renewed commitment to building a more sustainable world, the future we want and the UN we need. This reflection calls us to pay greater attention to the 2030 development agenda and the promotion and protection of human rights and equity for all. The current COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated and highlighted inequalities and exposed deep weaknesses in our governance and justice systems. The protection of our planet is critical moving forward and there can be no one left behind. Importantly, we must place women and girls at the center of the development agenda. While we recognize the progress made over the last 75 years, the increased global challenges call for growing investment in the United Nations and its many agencies for building as well as sustaining peace and in cooperation with civil society organizations. It means that we must build back more equitably and with greater resilience in the aftermath of COVID-19. The UN Association has been promoting the 2030 Agenda as the blueprint for tackling global challenges and the necessary framework for building a more sustainable future. Now is the time to invest in the decade of action and empower national, regional and local governments as well as the private sector and civil society to work in partnership for the effective implementation of the goals globally and locally. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Ulrika Modir, who serves since 2018 as Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau of External Relations and Advocacy for the UN Development Program. In this role, she leads the organization in nurturing and growing key relationships with member states, new and emerging partners, as well as leading UNDP communication and advocacy as it works to realize the vision of the Sustainable Development Goals. Ms. Modir previously served as Sweden's State Secretary for International Development, Cooperation and Climate, and has been instrumental in reshaping the country's international development cooperation to support the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. She combines a strong policy background with parliamentary and civil society experience and has had several assignments in Latin America and Africa. Ms. Modir, if I might call you Ulrika, uh, welcome and many thanks for joining us. The floor is yours.
Thank you so much, Paula. That was really managing expectations, but I'm so incredibly happy to be with you here today. And many thanks to you and to the UN Association of the National Capital Area for the opportunity. Uh, and of course, I want to start by thanking you and by extension, as was said also earlier on, even by the Secretary General, all UN associations for educating, for inspiring and for mobilizing Americans to support the UN principles and our work. Your work is wind in our sails, and I know that you know that we really need some strong winds in the sails if we are to move forward and not in reverse as it's actually happening now. I would also like to acknowledge the thoughtful work you have done in the past months highlighting social justice and racial equality, and I particularly appreciate seeing your recent report on the UN and the US and anti-racism documenting the UN's role on the global fight against racism, as was also mentioned. And I'm incredibly honored and also inspired to have the opportunity to listen to Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who has been, as we could see and really tell, and you are also fully aware of this, a long uh, time champion for international peace and diplomacy, human rights, women's rights, global health, and most importantly, perhaps, because how can we then bring all of these important areas of work forward on the global platform in the United Nations? We are, of course, also uh, on behalf of the United Nations and UNDP grateful for her leadership and this leadership that we can see also representing the US in various UN fora, but also for the principal support to US funding of a transparent and accountable UN system through the critical role that she, you, if you're still with us, play in the Congress. This is, of course, incredibly important for us to be able to move forward. So in the next few minutes, because I know that we will have a more interactive discussion, I'd like to take the opportunity of this gathering just to share with you uh, some of my perspectives on where we are in relation to the sustainable development goals as this time of great disruption, as we've mentioned, how the UN development system with UNDP, the development agency at its core is leveraging the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on climate change to help to see to the countries through the current crisis and then close with some thoughts on how much we at the UN depend on you as uh, advocates in Washington to help us to be the global organization which can help humanity through these turbulent times uh, and see to that nations and peoples come together as was also mentioned by the Congresswoman. In the last 30 years, I think it's also good that we remind ourselves to also see what are the opportunities out there. We have actually made great advances with regard to development. More than 1 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty since 1990 when UNDP started to measure this in our human development report with major gains made in health, in education and other areas that can contribute to human well-being. Global uh, maternal mortality ratio declined by 38% between 2000 and 2017. Fewer girls are forced into early marriage, while more, more women enter leadership positions. And more than 1 billion people acquired the essential services of electricity since 2010. So let's also in these difficult times remind us what can be done. And I think also we had in the introduction a great record also of really important areas of work and results also made possible using the UN platform since the very beginning of the organization. Now, celebrating success, uh, we are also painfully uh, aware of the situation that we have come into with the pandemic. But also, I believe it's important to remind us that even before the pandemic and five years into the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development Goals, the world was not on track to deliver on the SDGs by 2030. So when we assess this ahead of uh, last year's General Assembly, we could see that inequality continued to increase within and among countries. The number of people suffering from hunger and food insecurity continued to rise. And we were nowhere near being able to reach the climate change targets to stall the dangerous crossing over of temperature thresholds. So dear you and friends, the pandemic is really uh, preying on our collective failures. It is feeding on the SDG areas where we were off track already before the pandemic. 
Speaking in July on Nelson Mandela Day, the Secretary General said, inequality defines our time. And indeed, the virus is a shining, is shining a spotlight on inequalities of all kinds in all countries of, of the world and in all our cities. Today, the health of the most vulnerable is at far greater risk, and those without adequate health coverage before the pandemic are the ones succumbing to severe cases of the disease, as we know, also here in the US. The social and economic impact is concentrated on those who are the least able to cope. It is particularly hard on those who work in the informal economy, and that is 60% of the global workforce, I should add to small and medium-sized businesses and people with caring responsibility who are then, of course, mainly women. While talking, taking its heaviest toll on those with least amount of resources, the pandemic is likely to push another 100 million people into extreme poverty. Now, the pandemic has also been a siren call of the threats to our planet. Planet. The collision of this pandemic with a series of recent extreme weather events, and you have certainly also felt them here in the US, has amplified this call. Behind the painfully visible forest fires, hurricanes and floods, there is further correlation between the pressures on our natural ecosystems and the channels of viral outbreaks. Furthermore, as we know, air pollution already kills more than 7 million people worldwide every year. It's a pandemic in its own right, and it's happening at the same time as we're dealing with COVID-19. Pollution also exacerbates the underlying conditions for people at risk. So in short, the health of the planet and the well-being of people, they are so closely linked, and this is the time to show it. This is the time to make difference. The Sustainable Development Goals, they as you have said, I think all of you, they offer a blueprint. They are ready-made roadmap to get us back on track. And more importantly, they also offer a roadmap for recovery, to take us beyond recovery towards the 2030 goals. Progress towards achieving the SDGs has been threatened by the pandemic, that is correct. But however, we also believe that every crisis also brings opportunities. This is the opportunity to reset, to reclaim, and to recalibrate our SDG ambition. And also, as the Congresswoman said, this is really about also having everyone to understand that this is not a North-South agenda. This is the agenda for the world, for each and every country. Uh, because getting back to normal, as many of us say, is simply not feasible. Normal got us where we are today. Under normal, we are actually off track. And under normal, we are unable to bridge the inequalities on which the pandemic feed as we speak. And under the normal, we are off track from protecting our planet, our forests, and our waters. And under normal, we are backsliding on the SDGs. COVID-19 is forcing us to revisit our values and design a new area of development that truly balances the economic, social, and environmental progress by 2030 through the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And in some ways, the pandemic has given us the permission to do what was once almost unimaginable, and that is to redesign the way we work to achieve the SDGs. Now, just a little bit about UNDP, United Nations Development Program's role. The Secretary General asked UNDP to lead on the UN system's development response to the current crisis beyond recovery towards 2030. That is the socioeconomic response. So we've had, of course, the health response led by WHO. We have the humanitarian response led by the coordination OCHA. And then UNDP has been asked to lead on the socioeconomic assessment and response in coordination with other funds and programs. At country level around the world, uh, we are doing assessments, we are supporting countries with needs analysis, and we are working across the UN system to provide immediate assistance to prop up weak healthcare systems and to put in place programs that assist those most vulnerable of the impacts of the pandemic. And we are doing that in close coordination with other sister agencies of the UN, but also with the development banks. Once uh, uh, Politically unimaginable, we now lobby businesses and governments to establish temporary basic income schemes to help many people who are not covered by social insurance. We did that in Togo during 10 weeks. We were actually able 
to establish a mechanism in the midst of the crisis to reach 12% of the most vulnerable in Togo. And there are a number of examples that you will find on our webpage. So those not covered by social insurance, informal workers, low wage women and young people, refugees and also migrants and people with disabilities, in short term, the hardest hit by the crisis and inequalities. Why leave them uh, to only the support of humanitarian response? Why not build social security systems that could also uh, be the basis for a long-term solution to the problem that we're leaving so many people behind? UNDP is also supporting small businesses, uh, just to take some examples, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where an, our analysis shows that half of family-owned businesses could close in the next few months. And I guess you have seen also the latest figures in Europe and how the pandemic is once again spreading. In Ecuador, uh, we're crowdsourcing to connect the most vulnerable with food, goods and services. Uh, you know how hardly hit also the Latin American countries have been and still are. And in Afghanistan, we are supporting expanded social protection once again for the poor and vulnerable Africans, such as pensions for the elderly and pub, uh, public works. In Nigeria, and this is my final example, there are so many and you find them on our website. Uh, in Nigeria, we launched a basket fund, which uh, among others helped to deliver cash transfers and food to vulnerable groups. Now, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis threatens lives and li livelihoods of millions of people, particularly in developing countries. And it also puts at risk climate targets, of course, as priorities might shift in the response to the crisis. We cannot allow this to happen. COVID-19 recovery measures provide an unprecedented opportunity to restructure economies, to be more equitable, uh, resilient and climate responsive. So as I've said, we need to use this crisis to do things differently. Our development offered to countries is a green recovery based on the global goals and the Paris Agreement. And we advocate for economic stimulus packages that are designed in line with the global goals and the Paris Agreement. And as governments around the world patch together stimulus packages, they have a choice to make and they need to make the right choice not to move us further away from what we have decided on. Uh, they can stimulate fossil fuel industries and other remnants on the way things were. Short-term band-aids that will reinforce the collision course with nature, or they can invest in an inclusive green economy, in greens job and in people. That's why we are working closely with UNEP, uh, the United Nations Environment Agency, with FAO on agriculture, with UN Habitat and many others to see to that we can strengthen national commitments being developed in all member states as we speak to be delivered to the next COP on the Paris Agreement and link them to the green and resilient COVID recovery solutions to show that the green economy can actually be an economy that will help us take us further. Finally, in our UN Future We Want survey with data from 186 countries, and this is very promising, I must say, 95% of the respondents said that they want to see more cooperation between countries to deal with global issues and the global problems we have ahead of us. Climate change, pandemics, and the financial crisis do not, as we know, see any national boundaries, and they can only be solved through cooperation. Yet, just when we need international cooperation the most, we also see, as you know, wealthy countries turning inwards. Uh, we see more of nationalism and populism, and we see it across the world. And this brings me to the point I really want to make in the end, and that has been said before. We need you. We need you and associations worldwide, and we need you here in Washington to stand up for the need for multilateral solutions to global challenges and for the UN. The UN, as was said, is the only common global arena of the world, and we need to make it work. We need you to continue to foster global citizenship when many around us are turning uh, inwards. We need you to continue to support UN's work on peace, on climate change, on biodiversity also coming up importantly, and development and how this comes together in something that is promising and not least you were speaking also to young people, something that is really, really critical for them. 
So to be deserving of your support, we need, of course, also to see to that we constantly improve. Uh, the UN uh, we want to see is an agile organization. It's less bureaucratic, it's more coordinated, and it gets things done at country level. But it remains that fora where decision makers meet, have dialogue, and negotiate to find really important solutions to the global challenges we're facing. I was referring to UNDP's webpage. We are proud to be uh, once again rewarded as the most uh, transparent UN organization by IATI. Uh, so I really want also to close by inviting you, perhaps not now, but later on to UNDP's webpage. And we're happy also to provide you with a link where you'll find much more information. And the UN charter says, with the peoples, make use of us, the US invests, you're one of our biggest core contributors and we have a lot of interesting material and a lot of interesting discussions taking place on our platform. So please join us. Thank you, Paula, and over to you again. Thank you. Many thanks, Ulrika, for your insightful remarks and also the reminder to see this crisis, this pandemic as an opportunity an opportunity to reset and to really um, reflect on how we can foster a more sustainable world. Joining us now for a conversation about the critical role of the SDGs in shaping the future we want is Dr. Robert Orr who serves as Dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Previously, Dr. Orr served as the Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Planning in the Executive Office of the United Nations Secretary General from 2004 to 2014, and was the Principal Advisor to the Secretary General on Counterterrorism, Peacebuilding, Women's and Children's Health, Sustainable Energy, Food and Nutrition, institutional innovation, public-private partnership, and climate change. And he continues to play an important role as advisor to the Secretary General on climate change. Dr. Orr has served in senior posts in the government of the United States, including deputy to the United States ambassador to the United Nations and director of global affairs at the National Security Council, where he was responsible for peacekeeping and humanitarian affairs. Uh, we call him Bob in, in the UNA space because uh, Bob, Bob has been a wonderful friend uh, of UNA, of many of our UNAs uh, and a great supporter of our mission. So thank you, Bob, for joining us. Thank and you. let's dive in. Um, we're really privileged to have both of you and your expertise today. So I'm gonna be asking questions and I'm gonna be directing my questions to Rika from a global perspective and to Bob um, same questions, but I would like for him to address it from, from the local US perspective uh, when possible. The SDGs are globally agreed goals, as we all know. When many think of the SDGs, they're thinking about the big UN building in New York where world leaders are thinking and talking about progress and setbacks. But I would like to hear from you if the SDGs are meaningful for framing and measuring local level progress in the cities and towns where we live, both here in the US, but also around the globe. In other words, are the SDG targets and indicators meaningful for local actors? Can they be meaningfully adopted and adapted? Who would Bob, you like would to like start? To start? Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and it's wonderful to join Ulrika and, and to uh, see her on the screen here. Um, Paula, thank you uh, both for the invitation to join, uh, but I, I also welcome your challenge, if I could call it that, for me to address the U.S. situation. I'm, I'm so used to having to respond as an international official on the global situation that that's the <laughs> natural place my brain goes. But the bottom line is that uh, the United States and every US citizen has a huge uh, impact on the work of the UN. And I think US citizens generally don't appreciate how big that influence actually is. Um, on the SDGs, I will tell you the situation could not be more different in the US than it was when the MDGs were launched. The U.S. never uh, uh, 
felt ownership of the MDGs in the same way that the US writ large feels ownership of the SDGs. I think this shows some maturation on the part of uh, US uh, decision making, but also the active US citizenry that uh, really feels the SDGs uh, affect them and that they're a part of this process. Um, I will tell you from a, a point of view of a dean of a school that um, young people in the United States are extremely knowledgeable about the SDGs, extremely engaged, um, usually can not only reference all the SDGs in a conversation, but can make the connections between them. And I think this is a level of sophistication about the application of the SDGs that we just didn't have that option 10, 15 years ago. Today we do. So can we apply them uh, at the local level? Absolutely. Um, in fact, my university is going through the process of adopting the SDGs and applying it to all of the operations of our university. That's a challenge. Um, uh, you know, we are the size of a small city. It's a large university, but going through the SDGs as a way to do your planning uh, across your whole business, uh, in this case, a, an educational institution. But I know a lot of companies that have also adopted the MDGs as a framework, cities, states. So I think the SDGs are scalable. They are a global, uh, globally agreed framework, but it's a framework that you can apply at all levels. And I love the challenge of being an American and applying the SDG framework in my home country. Uh, something that when I was helping to develop the SDGs oh so many years ago, I didn't quite foresee, but I'll tell you it's, uh, it's happening and it is being driven by young people. So if I can add to that, I, I believe also uh, having been part of uh, the road towards the decision, there were a lot of people who were concerned about the number of goals and how they would come together. I used in the beginning to speak about the three aspects of sustainability that finally after decades of discussion in the international community based on science, we had an agenda combining economic sustainability with social sustainability and environmental sustainability. So I think that's the kind of story you need to craft. We also certainly have a lot of examples how different actors, countries, cities, regions, but also, as you said, uh, well, uh, companies and investors also make use of the SDGs. So we know it's possible. We have the system of the voluntary national reviews and they're actually the city of New York is presenting also its, its voluntary uh, city review and other cities are doing that as well. But what I believe is most important is that we give advice and tools to countries, regions, cities, but also to the private actors to integrate it into the core business. And of course, that is the budget process of a country uh, to start with. We have also some interesting examples of that. And UNDP supports uh, the government in Ukraine, for instance. We uh, support them to see how they can then work with their cities and regions uh, to use also the indicators as this kind of, of framework and, and roadmap. But we have a number of examples that we can also share with you and where you can also be inspired. I mean, as a city, in the case of, of Washington, uh, to also have this kind of twinning projects also with other cities, uh, um, uh, as we speak, uh, because it's really, I think, gaining a momentum, as you say, among young people. Uh, I was on a call uh, with Japan early this morning, um, late night for them, uh, but there we have uh, the second biggest city also uh, aligning their budget with the Sustainable Development Goals, Kanagawa. And so there is a huge interest actually in what uh, they call the localization of the agenda. And of course, then they would attach that to the national now good uh, news we got yesterday with regard to, to net uh, emissions from Japan by 2050. So how also the cities can contribute also to the Paris Agreement as part of their uh, integration of the SDGs into budget planning and so on. And on behalf of really, really important investors, we also see an increased interest. So the impact investment communities, they have their ESG standards and there are a number of different, but many of them have also come forward and said to UNDP and, and uh, 
there has been discussions within the impact investment community that we need actually something that is more advanced. We need process guidance to really look at the entire SDGs and not only on, on, on certain of, of the SDGs. And, and as you said also, Bob, how they come together and can be beneficial also when we look at them as a full, full agenda. So I think that there is a lot to learn from and there are a lot of things happening a lot more perhaps than we would believe. And I think it's gaining a momentum. We see it in, in, in Asia, we see it in Europe, and I, I also hope to see and to build a lot of good examples also here in the US. Absolutely. I could not agree more with both of you. Um, there is certainly a momentum and um, youth is definitely playing a critical role in moving that agenda forward and, and localizing the SDGs. Um, at the UN Association, at least in, in the chapter that I led, we, we have a history of being involved in um, educating and mobilizing uh, our members and constituents so they understand uh, what these goals are from a local perspective, uh, from engaging in consultations to most recently, um, we have a project that will be mapping basically how the SDGs are being implemented in DC, Maryland, and, and Virginia. And Bob will be working with you and the university. Um, I'm okay. excited to hear that um, that is happening. So what are the primary challenges globally in achieving the SDGs? We often talk about what needs to be done in the developing world, but Ulrika, can you speak to what roles and responsibilities rich countries have? Are they living up to their responsibilities? What can UNAs do? And I know you alluded a little bit during your uh, wonderful remarks. No, well, I think, uh, I mean, it's important to see that many of the challenges that we're mentioning when we're talking okay. about uh, us moving backwards are challenges that we see and face both in the least developed countries, in middle income countries and in the richest economies. I mean, I was mentioning uh, inequality uh, case in point, you know, that we see increasing across uh, the member states, uh, but also then, of course, between uh, member states. Uh, but also, of course, uh, when we look at an area, once again, such as climate change, we really need policy coherence for development, because it's incredibly important that countries who are the high emitters take on the responsibility and also show leadership. And this is why we were happy also to see to such, uh, such a strong economy as uh, the Japanese economy now committing to an ambitious target. And we've seen the EU earlier on. Uh, so it is important. Uh, I would also want to stress in these times that it's incredibly important also to have uh, the UN Association support for international development cooperation as such. Uh, when needed the most, we actually see that um, foreign direct investments are decreasing by 40%. Remittances, incredibly important, as you know, uh, a country of migrants to so many of the developing economies is also decreasing drastically. And at the same time, we also see the risk that ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, is decreasing. So this is kind of a perfect storm. So I would actually put higher on the agenda also the call to maintain uh, international development cooperation in the budgets, as we see also many rich countries having also concerns and problems, of course, and a lot of uh, um, costs also in their own countries because of the pandemic. It's still such a small portion of the economy. I know many citizens believe that governments across the world are pouring money into the UN, but we know that the central budget of the UN is, I believe, to be compared with um, the, the um, uh, fire uh, service and, and, and uh, health service in, in New York. So it's, it's really, I mean, if we look at it, just a small, small portion, but it's very much needed because now we have also, I think many of us as development actors identify ways of scaling up. If we get that contribution uh, from the US and also other countries, we can also use with the work closely with the private sector to scale up development finance in a smart way. So I think uh, to continue to also defend uh, the investment uh, in development cooperation and in the US, the UN is, is incredibly important. Thank you. Bob, would you like to add to that? Just a, a quick uh, coda on Ulrika's uh, comment about the role of rich countries. I like the way you phrased the question, Paula. Um, 
we have to be able to walk the walk and, and uh, do these things at home, uh, but reminding ourselves that there is a responsibility for a global response. And in addition to uh, her very strong and very correct remarks about the value of development assistance, uh, it goes a long way and the United States has not performed as we should over many years, and I would say decades. Uh, but uh, the inclusion of other sources of US wealth and expertise into this equation, uh, getting uh, US companies, getting US civil society, getting US uh, universities, the, the US has many sources of support for SDGs around the world. And it, it's interesting that uh, um, as we look at what we can do, um, some of these things are tools in the hands of the US federal government, but it is increasingly uh, falling to those of us at all levels of society that we can have a direct partnership, direct impact. And it's not either or, I think we have to do both. We need direct work with uh, other countries, especially in the developing world. We can learn a lot from them as well. Um, but then we also need to advocate for the, the national response because that is a part of the compact that created the SDGs. Absolutely. Our world faces the indomitable threat of a climate catastrophe if we continue on this path of inaction. Bob, what climate action should the U.S. prioritize? This is where I'm going to sound like a UN official and not a US citizen. <laughs> I knew it. I, I've got uh, views that would come as a US citizen and as a UN official. But you know, all joking aside, let me say um, uh, the United States' absence from the international climate regime in uh, recent years has been uh, very much noticed. It has negatively impacted the global climate response but it is striking how much the rest of the world has moved on. The question of whether US pullback from the Paris Agreement would doom it, I think has been answered resoundingly no. Uh, the world for its own interests and every country for its own interests has kept, keep, kept moving forward. Um, that's not to say that we don't need the US back in. The, the Paris Agreement is a remarkable international agreement. In fact, unprecedented in many ways. And it provides an extremely useful framework for all countries. Uh, the US is needed to really uh, accelerate and increase our ambition. Uh, we have a year here um, with the pandemic, The uh, ratchet, uh, so-called ratcheting up our ambition was to happen in 2020. It will now happen in Glasgow uh, this time or a little bit later uh, next year. So we have a little over a year to prove that we can rise to the level of ambition that is necessary. And Ulrika mentioned the Japanese announcement uh, yesterday. Uh, really important. Uh, Europe has shown leadership, Japan has stepped forward, China has stepped forward. The coalition is getting there. Um, and uh, I think there, that some fundamental things have changed in the United States. Uh, the bottom up uh, climate action in the United States has really been supercharged in the last four years. Uh, but looking forward to having a full U.S. participation in the Paris Agreement and the process that unwinds over the next year. Thank you. Ulrika, the same question to you from a global perspective. What climate action is UNDP prioritizing? Thank you. And I would like to start by saying that, I mean, UNDP has been around for decades and uh, our main work has been to combat poverty, to strengthen uh, good governance, rule of law, uh, human rights, to prevent conflict. I mean, the traditional uh, work of UNDP has really been within that field. Uh, but of course, uh, the past years, uh, UNDP has also been increasingly important uh, on the ground in countries because we are asked to be there with them as they also give increasing priority to the work on climate change adaptation. 
but they also see the possibilities uh, with regard to mitigation to leapfrog into a new green economy. And also, as we mentioned before, how biodiversity and the investment in nature can actually also be an investment in, in development. So I've been quite fascinated because not so many years ago, and Bob, you would know this also, it would not have been uh, the central discussion during our board meetings. That would always be you know, focused on, on poverty reduction. But now so many of the member states represented also in the board of UNDP, they understand that this will be at the heart of development efforts. This will also link to security policies and everything we do onwards. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to see how fast also countries pick it up, but also see uh, besides all the risks and problems, actually the opportunities. So I think that the focus on renewable energy that we've seen speaks to also job creation and how we need also, not least now because of the times we're in, where countries and people are so focused to kind of get back to normal, to showcase that we're not going back to normal, we're going beyond recovery towards the achievement. We're actually going to create that green economy that can also be inclusive and, and bring jobs and, and hope for, for the young generation. We have in the midst of, of the crisis a pro program uh, coordinated also by other actors. Uh, the World Resource Institute also in Washington is part of, of coordinating this effort, support to what is called the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions. They are uh, the concrete plans at country level that each country has to develop. And now they are taking a, a look at them and revising them to be more ambitious and hopefully also uh, more actionable. So we are supporting 114 member states as we speak, and some of them are the high emitters who want to discuss how to really improve their action, both with regard to mitigation, but also adaptation. Uh, and they are also looking at how to integrate this and, and resource it as part of their uh, recovery plans. So I think it's quite promising. And, and uh, I also say, as you did, Bob, that the world is really uh, moving forward now and they see the need, but also the possibilities. And of course, uh, we also would want to see all member states and not least such an important member state as, as the US to be part of this uh, effort. Um, it's, it's important, it's, it's happening as we speak. And, and I think uh, the UN will only be, be stronger in, in our efforts. Uh, the more uh, member states that engage. And as we've said, a number of them are uh, engaging heavily uh, as we speak. So I think we have quite a good process leading us towards uh, the next COP uh, meeting. Uh, and then next year also the discussions on biodiversity. But given the scale of the crisis, uh, we need to roll up our sleeves. We don't have that much of time um, to get this uh, done. I agree. We understand that the SDGs are integrated. They converge in a number of ways. Targets in gender equality are related to those in education and health, for example, or targets for poverty are linked to the protection of natural resources, both above and underwater. But I would like to push you both. If you had to pick one SDG to prioritize, which one would you start with? I'm going to make Ulrika go first on that one. That's a hard question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have a, a way to answer that question, and that is goal 17. Goal 17 is about partnership. I believe partnership is the new leadership. It's so rewarding uh, to work in the UN right now because we have so many different actors stepping forward, uh, and they want to work closely with the UN. It has been very obvious now as you celebrate 75 years. I mean, ranging from our artists and goodwill ambassadors who you would believe, you know, would engage in one topic, but they actually step forward because they say we need a rules based world order. We need this platform uh, to uh, discuss on a science based uh, uh, discussion and, and, and move forward with, with negotiations. But also we have increasingly, I mean, the private sector and they are not, I mean, some of them still, but but I mean, we really see also a shift with regard to core business models. And as I said, also upstream, the investors saying that we are no longer investing if we can't see the impact in relation to the SDGs or the Paris Agreement. Um, 
And then, of course, I mean, member states, but sometimes you can actually see that the decision makers in countries are kind of lagging behind the broad number of actors that we see stepping, stepping forward and creating these really incredible and, and really promising partnerships. Uh, innovation, I mean, we have accelerated labs at country level also uh, working with young innovators. And I would very much like also to connect you with that if you're also having a way also to engage more young people in your UN association. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see how many people who want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So I, I believe gold 17 uh, partnerships will actually make the other goals happen. Uh, and gold 17 also speaks to the importance of looking at the three aspects of sustainability at one time. Well, as the uh, Secretary General Senior Advisor on Climate Change, I think I have to say, uh, goal 13, but um, there is an overarching quality to climate change that, that does impact literally every one of the SDGs. So it is almost uh, integration in and of itself to address uh, goal 13. Uh, but I do want to give a, a special shout out to a goal that doesn't get the same kind of attention that, um, uh, that 13 does, and that is just drop one number down. How many people on this call, I wonder, even know what goal 12 is? Um, all right, Ulrika, she, you, you get credit, I, I believe you. Um, usually if I ask that question, there is a lot of sheepish looks in the room because people know one, they know two, they know three, you know they four, they know 17, they know 13, but poor little humble 12, responsible consumption and production. The reason I wanna give a shout out for this one is every single person on this call can think about and address what they consume, how they consume it and affect the people around them. And I will tell you, this is where youth are leading in, in other like unbelievable ways, um, changing the consumption of their families. Um, parents, grandparents actually follow and listen to kids when it comes to things like what you're eating, are you driving, are you taking public transportation? Um, these are things that everyone can do. And I think responsible consumption and production does aggregate. And if we're going to achieve the overall uh, SDGs, I would love to see more concerted attention on what individuals and um, uh, organizations can do on goal 12 because it is a building block for uh, the whole SDGs. Well said, and that obviously is also connected to access to quality education in order for all of us to make uh, informed decisions and sustainable decisions. So um, thank you so much. We are running out of time for, the sec for this segment. So I have one final question for you to answer briefly and since UN 75 is about reflecting on the last 75 years of work of the UN and looking forward to the next 75 years how do you feel are you optimistic what primary challenges will need to be overcome uh, in order to build the future that we want a more sustainable world So maybe I can start. I mean, once again, I believe that uh, safeguarding the dialogue. Um, I will tell you, when I uh, left Sweden two years ago to work with the UN, I uh, was really longing to work in this international environment, uh, besides, of course, experiencing New York as a city. But still, it was really uh, that um, idea uh, to, to work in an international organization. In Sweden at that time, we had a very was ahead of elections and there was a, uh, a lot of discussion about Swedish values because of the discussions you've heard about on migration that is also taking place in, in Europe. Um, and I, <laughs> I was saying so many times then that, you know, are they really Swedish values? Wouldn't Sweden benefit then from speaking about these values as universal values? Because of course, when you come to work with the UN, uh, I mean, with the colleagues also working in the UN, but the missions, the countries also being represented, you will see there are so many people who actually subscribe to those uh, values. Uh, they are not Swedish, they are called human rights. and the space for, for dialogue and the belief that we can actually come together uh, to, 
to seek solutions. I think we really need to maintain that belief and not listen to the voices who say that we are divided, but actually think that there are so many more people and our service speaks to that, that understand that we need uh, these global solutions uh, to really build a better future for. Well, Paula, the, I love the question, um, uh, are you optimistic? Because at this point in time, uh, the world is going through an exceedingly difficult patch. And I don't mean just the pandemic and the economic effects from the pandemic. The move towards um, uh, nationalism in many parts of the globe, the political trends, the economic trends uh, are, uh, are disconcerting. But I am optimistic because we have a level of global agreement on what the priorities are and the SDGs are extremely important in this regard, just as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is. Having a global agreement, a global framework we can all go after is a huge first step. Um, we also have the resources to do this. We have the human resources, we have the financial resources. Uh, we just have to bring everyone to the party. Um, this can't just be the business of national governments. We need to keep activated our civil society, our local governments, our state governments, our businesses. And that's what's happening with the SDGs and more broadly on climate change as well. So I am optimistic because mobilizing these different sources of power to address these issues really gives us the tools we need to, to address them. And an anniversary is a great time to kind of pull back and think in time frames you don't normally think about. You know, I, I'm a, a planner, so I get crazy and sometimes think about five to 10 years out. You know, 75 years, my goodness, I have no idea what the world's going to look like. But I do know that it is going to be a much more integrated world even than we see today, the current kind of backsliding notwithstanding. Uh, I think it will also be a world in which cooperation around the world is just assumed. Um, we've had to fight hard to cooperate across the world in recent years. Um, I do think the trend lines are very clear that global cooperation is not only necessary, but uh, uh, everyone will demand it. And I think that gives me hope that we'll get there. Just one final statement, since you, you identified me as an American at the, begin of the beginning of this, I used to get a lot of people at the UN say, oh God, of course, you're so optimistic. You're so American. Would you just stop it with being so optimistic? Well. We've had our comeuppance. Uh, it's hard to be optimistic if you're an American these days. I think we have to challenge ourselves to reclaim our optimism. Um, it is something about our country I love and we have to earn it, but I think we can be optimistic uh, and apply ourselves to, to implement what that optimism requires of us. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. I like American optimist. <laughs> Let's reclaim. <laughs> Let's reclaim the optimism. Thank you so much to both of you, Ulrika and Bob, uh, for sharing your expertise and, and vision uh, for a more sustainable world, the future we want. Um, really, thank you so much. You have made this a, a special occasion for all of us. And, and we look forward to continue collaborating with you in different ways. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you for the You are welcome to stay for, for the remaining segment of the program. Um, and now I'm going to call our Vice Chair of Programs, Tom Bradley, for the introduction of the next segment. Tom? Thank you, Paula. And thank you, Ms. Modir and Dr. Orr. We appreciate your taking the time to illuminate these important challenges for us on this celebratory milestone and critical year for the United Nations. UNANCA, our local chapter, participated earlier this year in consultations that were requested by Secretary General Antonio Guterres to help the UN determine how to create the future the world desires. Our advisory council and board of directors gathered voices from our region and passed a report to UNA USA, the national organization, who in turn presented the report to the United Nations. 
across all 50 states, the District of Columbia and territories, over 1,800 people participated in more than 80 consultation events. The consultations responded to three key questions. First, are we on track to secure a better world? The short answer from our American consultations, no. 13% predict a better world in the future, 10% are uncertain, and 77% believe the state of the world will be worse if current trends continue. Second, what kind of future do we want to create? The American answers included a belief that we must make progress on many of the 17 sustainable development goals, and particularly on goal 13, climate action, goal 10, reduced inequalities in all aspects of human life, goal 18, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and goal four, quality education. Strong progress on these goals would help us achieve a brighter future. Third, we ask what action is needed to help us achieve a brighter future. American participants outlined actions for individual people, for organizations and national governments, for UNA USA and for the United Nations itself. As individuals, we must take responsibility to engage in our communities and with government officials. We must educate ourselves and others about global challenges, and we must make personal changes towards sustainable lifestyle choices. UNA NCA and UNA USA must engage locally and nationally with people, organizations, and governments to get them on board with the UN's efforts to drive positive changes. In other words, we all must be activists and advocates for the sustainable development goals. The full consultation report and a summary of it are available on our UNA NCA website. Now we'll turn to our breakout sessions. You will be sent automatically to a breakout group based on the topic you selected at the time you registered for this event. The breakout group will be moderated by a UNA NCA leader. We hope that you'll discuss the questions that they have developed to enlighten us all on different ways we may help achieve a better world for the future. We'll be in the breakout groups for about 25 minutes and you will get a five minute warning uh, before the group is returned to the plenary session. The moderators for our six breakout sessions are for gender equity, Kristen Hecht, our vice chair for membership, for global health, Shana Vaser, our managing director for advocacy and policy strategy, for human rights, Rachel Bergsiker, co-chair of our human rights committee, for international law, Renee Doplick, co-chair of our international law committee, for peace and security, Don Bliss, past president of UNANCA, and for sustainable development, Kim Weichel, past chair of our advisory council and senior advisor to our sustainable development committee. Your moderator will ask one person in each group to report back to the full group a few themes or takeaways from your group's discussion. Your reporter will be asked to take notes and to speak for no more than two minutes. Have fun and happy time connecting. Thank you for your active participation and the staff will send you to the breakouts now. Thank you. All right, I think we're back. I see 46 people back in, uh, back in the plenary session. So I'd like to uh, call on the groups one by one to, uh, to give a short, about one and a half minute to two minute uh, summary uh, of takeaways, things that you thought were important. So for gender equity, uh, Chris and I assume you appointed a, uh, a reporter. Uh, please call on her or him. Our reporter is Radia, so I'm gonna invite Radia to go ahead and un unmute yourself and share with the group. Oh, good. She was one of our grad fellows last spring. Um, so hi, everyone. It's really nice to see everyone here. So I'm gonna report for the gender group we were actually just for. <laughs> Um, so we talked about the consultation that Tom mentioned on um, how to secure a better world and we um, brought in the perspective of gender and what will be the, where, where will be the better um, um, sectors for room for improvement. So we talked about um, um, the possibility of improving the world through climate change, poverty, new tech and new technologies. Um, so each of us kind of discussed where we thought will be uh, room for improvement in those different sectors. 
Uh, we talked about how the climate crisis is something really important to consider nowadays because um, we don't see a future where um, improvement can actually happen if the world is not um, giving us the space that we need for this improvement to happen in the first place. Um, we also talked about how climate change also affects poverty and all um, how new technologies can even be used um, to kind of uh, mitigate the situation and how um, more situations are created by climate change such as displacement and um, how that should be maybe the starting point. Um, we also talked about poverty as also another important point um, because women are usually considered as caregivers. Um, so um, there's a need to start from the poverty point of view um, and then climate change will fit well into that because poverty is the main issue that will basically worsen the situations of women in most of these, um, these situations. Um, and then the third point we talked about was increased um, access to female education. Um, as we thought that um, educating basically women will be um, a good factor for them to be engaged as um, leaders also in politics and basically influence descriptive and substantive um, the description um, representation in governments. Thank you, Radia. Uh, well done, Radia and Kristen. And next, uh, Global Health. Shana, if you have someone. Thanks, Tom. I'll hand things over to Carolyn to talk about our discussion. Thank you. All right, this is Carolyn. Hi, everyone. So in the Global Health uh, Breakout Group, we talked about the link of climate change to public health. And obviously, there's a very direct coalition. We determined that when you think about the you know, disasters that we're currently experiencing and have experienced across the world. And hurricanes, temperature changes, how they impact health. So for example, we talked about how temperatures and you know, um, floodings can cause vectors that cause disease, how the air quality can affect respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. So the link is very connected. But we also talked about the intersectionality of climate change and health, health risk and how it impacts inequality, social justice, environmental injustices and racism. So there's a lot of interconnections there and intersections there that can be discussed or uh, discussed and um, addressed with policy uh, changes as well as uh, real activism. The second question, the, the second uh, thing that we talked about was the idea, the concept of One Health. And we all agree that that is something that we need to be talking about, you know, together. So instead of siloing human health, animal health, and environmental health to separate them, it, it, it's important for us to advocate for looking at these things together because the siloing sometimes is what defragments how we approach things and we address one thing. When we address one thing and not the other, then we, you know, it, it, it has negative consequences for that. So it's looking at the bigger picture of One Health and only separating it um, when it comes to measuring whether we're achieving what we need to achieve. And there was an emphasis of community participation, making sure that there's representation at the table and, um, and thinking about health being the cross carding cross, you know, across all sections, right? So health is your wealth. If you, you're not healthy, you're not gonna have a good economy. If you're not healthy, there's all these other things that are impacted. And last, the only last thing that we discussed was why do we have these silos? Uh, and mostly it's funding, but we also decided not to, you know, have rose glasses on this. But there's also the political landscape. So it's whatever is hot in the politics uh, arena that will be funded or addressed, and the trends in the, you know, the national or global uh, trends that are going on. Uh, sometimes that influences what we'll be focused on. And also organizational focus areas and priorities can also influence what people are talking about or what they're funding or what you know, they want to bring to the table. We did not quite get a chance to discuss fully about changes in global health in the future, but we can see that you know, whatever policies are applied funding, whatever funding goes, uh, all these things are things that will impact things. And there's also, um, I think Tina was talking about the impact of chemicals uh, on health. So no matter what, um, how the future looks like, you know, 
we need to continue to have these discussions and the more we talk about them and how they intersect, that will be uh, the best approach for um, addressing situations. Okay, thank you so much, Shana and uh, Carolyn. Next up, uh, human rights. Rachel, you have a spokesperson? I did not get a spokesperson, but I got a reporter. So I have notes to read <laughs> myself from a, a committee. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. So we really talked about how Americans are really well suited to take on the challenges of the SDGs and human rights today because, you know, we're a lot of us are really optimistic about it, as well as the fact that we are innovators and, um, you know, thinking about the idea that you know, a lot of us a few years ago were not using like disposal or, you know, reusable grocery bags or composting. And these are all changes that, you know, a lot of people have made in their lives and that we can really, um, you know, then, you know, see a wider movement across the country to take on these different challenges that we see and um, threats to the future that we want to create. Um, you know, one thing that we can do to help create the future that we want is to be open to dialogue with others. We are living in extremely partisan times right now, but if we are open to dialogue, it's really how we can help create the change that we want to see. Um, and we have to definitely have that dialogue with people who aren't, um, who disagree with us. Um, so it really is incumbent on us to be having these conversations both with our, you know, our own networks, but then also with our elected officials. And um, we've talked also a lot about how youth, the youth are the generation that are really gonna be um, taking on leadership with addressing these global changes and the importance of really making sure that the youth understand how you know the SDGs and human rights apply to their everyday lives, as opposed to being seen as something that's just on a global or international scale, but something that's happening within their own communities. And it really needs to start at a grassroots human rights level. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rachel. Appreciate your leading that and taking those notes. Next up, international law. Renee, I know you have a spokesperson. We do. Um, but first, I want to say, as co-chair of the International Law Committee, I want to thank all the participants for brainstorming important issues related to international law and the SDGs for the year ahead. I also want to thank our committee member and advocacy fellow, Kaylee Thompson, for serving as the official recorder for our session. In the UN 75th Declaration, I want to note that UN member states reaffirmed that, quote, we will abide by international law and ensure justice. The purpose and principles of the Charter of the United Nations and international law remain timeless, universal, and indispensable foundation for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. Now I want to turn to board member and committee member Ambassador Steve McGann for a quick recap of our thought-provoking discussion. Ambassador, please proceed. Well, thank you, Renee. Uh, let me begin by saying I actually have two challenges in giving this report. The first is that it's hard for any former ambassador to speak less than two minutes. And the second is I'm neither a lawyer or a law student. Mm -hmm. But that said, I think there's one theme uh, that uh, came throughout our session, and that is the need to rebuild trust in the United States adherence to the legal frameworks established under the UN Charter. And if you look at the key issues that the committee raised, uh, ranging from uh, UNGA votes on uh, making nuclear nonproliferation and banning testing as an international objective, we focus on environmental uh, and biodiversity protections as important issues. We also focus on making sure that pandemic resolutions should include debt relief and rethinking social equity issues, uh, particularly gender. Uh, more importantly, we also took a, a stab at looking at new ways to reframe addressing cybersecurity, uh, cyber warfare, and individual privacy. But most importantly, to achieve any of these goals, there has to be a greater public information campaign on how the United States and other 
uh, countries comply with UN resolutions and initiatives. But most importantly, we have to move the United States in a bipartisan way in order to get congressional legislation that will undergird existing conventions and treaties, as well as executive agreements. So I think in a nutshell, this really captures the direction we were heading in keeping the focus on maintaining uh, adherence to international law in the UN system. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We appreciate it. Uh, next up, for peace and security, Don, I believe uh, we have uh, Rebecca Contreras, who is one of our UNA NCA interns now, and a recent graduate of Davidson College. Rebecca? <laughs> um, so in the peace and security group, we discussed um, ways that the UN can be more effective in achieving its fundamental mission. So what we discussed were the Security Council, peacekeeping, conflict prevention, and resolution for building sustainable peace. Um, so with regards to the Security Council, one of the things that came up was that it no longer really represents the way that the world is structured today, and it really isn't representative of the world that we live in. Um, one of the primary concerns that kind of came up was that the UN has a mission of being egalitarian and promoting um, equality across the globe, um, but that the way that the Security Council continues to work kind of promotes a colonial model because it no longer, um, because it makes decisions for countries in that countries are not, um, and countries aren't being part of that decision-making process. Um, and so we discussed different ways that the Security Council can be reformed. Um, one of them was changing the veto power. Um, However, we did discuss that this may be challenging because um, the major superpowers won't want to give up some of those powers. Um, so one of the ways that we discussed that this could happen is to improve regional representation and that that would have to primarily happen through pressure from um, regional bodies, be that the African Union, Organization of American States, um, and potentially increasing permanent members um, that are more representative of the globe and of specific regional needs. Um, then regarding peacekeeping, um, we talked of issues of abuse, uh, lack of adequate training um, and lack of accountability. Um, and one of the things that we briefly mentioned was a need to not just go immediately with peacekeeping operations, but to try and use um, soft power to try and reduce um, conflict in regions to make peacekeeping not a, a necessity. Um, and then the final point that we touched on was on preventing conflict um, and what, are, what ways can be used um, to more effectively prevent conflict and maintain um, peace in fragile states. And the biggest solution that we came up with um, was education, um, the need to partner with governments and local, um, and local units and really bring in youth into conversations of peace and sustainable peace across the globe. Um, and one way that we discussed that this could happen is to really have international initiatives um, and international training programs so that you, we can learn the best practices to prevent conflict and promote sustainable peace and kind of how to implement those best solutions and those best practices in different contexts across the globe. Um, and I think finally, what we mentioned was just the importance of civil society and individuals in promoting change and kind of pushing for um, different organizations to hear these voices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca uh, and Don. And finally, to bring it all home, uh, the Sustainable Development Breakout Group uh, headed by Kim Weichel. And did you have a reporter? Yes, yeah, so we had a really rich discussion and Cassidy is gonna summarize it for us, Cassidy. Hi everyone, um, I'm an advocacy fellow at UNANCA and I will be summarizing our discussion on sustainable development. So during our discussion, we talked about how we can take these global goals and really localize them and um, encourage civil society to participate and own um, the SDG goals. So the first theme that we kind of talked about was um, the fact that the SDGs have come out with a city guide. Um, so the ways in which that local governments can really connect their own goals um, with the UN goals. So like connecting 
um, economic plans and integrating some of the SDG goals. Um, one example that was brought up was the city resolution um, 3030 program, which is 30% of natural spaces should be preserved by 2030. And that's a way in which um, local initiatives can connect with the SDG goals. Um, and then we also talked about the ways in which um, nonprofits, NGOs, and grassroots organizing is really important to be brought in the UN space. So focusing on topics such as environmental justice um, and inequality and um, youth movements into spaces that um, the UN operates and creating platforms for them. Um, we also discussed um, also like don donor programs and the ways that like three-year IMF programs can also be implemented um, to really like forward the UN goals. Um, and ultimately, what else? Sorry, it was a really diverse conversation. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, sure. Also, um, analysis at local level is really important. So like um, think tanks and um, policy analysts and bringing, you know, UN goals to the local level and really adapting them to certain cities um, is really important. And then we finished off our discussion about um, our own favorite um, goals. So we got to each choose which goal we liked and why we liked it. Good, well, thank you so much, Cassidy and Kim for, uh, for leading that discussion. I will attempt to email all the moderators and the reporters tonight to ask you to scan in and send me your handwritten notes, rough as they are, send me your handwritten notes on the, on the discussions if you wouldn't mind. And with that, Thank you so much to all the moderators and to the participants in the breakouts. Back to you, Paula. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to all those who facilitated and participated in the breakout sessions. Um, we are coming to the end of our program and we will conclude with a, a musical performance. But before that, I do wanna thank you all again for participating in today's or tonight's UN Day uh, special program. So. Happy 75 United Nations. I, I hope uh, you enjoyed Paula, this program. Yes. Paula, can we all unmute and give you and your whole team an applause that we could hear? <laughs> all right. Why don't we all give each other? <laughs> I said at the beginning of the program, everything that we do, we do at UNA is a team effort. So. There are many, many to thank that made tonight's uh, program possible, uh, including our sponsors and partners and volunteers and obviously the wonderful staff. So happy 75. I hope you all enjoy the program as much as I did. Remember that we are committed to strengthening the relationship between the US and the UN. And more than ever before, this movement of Americans that are that we are, UN Association, um, educating and advocating uh, for having a strong US leadership in the UN has never been more critical. So thank you for what you do here in our BMB area and beyond. I know we had a lot of participants from other chapters and perhaps other countries. Thank you for what you do every day at the local level to help um, raise awareness and implement the SDGs. So now I'm having the pleasure of introducing Jordan Moore, who was introduced to us by our board chair uh, elect, Jill Christensen. His name is Jordan Moore, and Jordan is a multi-instrumental musician, music educator, and online content creator, who is a recent graduate of the East Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester. Jordan began playing euphonium, which is, a, I've never heard about that instrument before at age 10 and quickly became interested in learning other standard wind uh, ensemble instruments. By age 15, he self-taught in six different instruments. This evening, Jordan will be performing concertino for trombone and piano by Ferdinand David. Jordan? Good evening, and before I get started, I'd just like to thank again Jill Christensen for connecting me to Andrew 
and giving me this opportunity to perform for you. I've chosen a rather festive piece of music originally for trombone, and I'll be playing it here on my euphonium. And here we go. Jordan, thank you. Thank you oh, very so much. Fun.
You have earned your UNA membership in the <laughs> NCA chapter. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. for introducing us. Yes. And thank you all. Happy UN 75.